Okay, so let's see what we've got here. So they added an entire plugin, um, and it looks like okay, good, good, good. Okay. We can join another meeting if we like have. Yeah, we. I'm good to go over. Um, let's see. So first row contains comments. Bool true. Okay, so as far as um, obviously, you guys know that this is, um, uh, you know, I would say lowercase this, right? Um, so let's lowercase this. Um, also, that's way too long. Um, uh, so we could say. For example, you know, this might be a good thing for field. So, so what are we looking at here when we're doing this? Okay, so essentially, um, most of what I do when I'm reviewing code is thinking more about, like, mostly about maintaining the code going forward. Um, because the thing is, the code is always going to change. So what's most important in my mind is making it so that there won't be large problems if we do change it, you know, um, it's because we're sort of assuming, you know, we assume if there's one thing that's true, we know it's that software has bugs, right? So we're assuming that the code will, will possibly have bugs. So how do we make it this is sort of like my general mindset. How do we make it so that there's less problems when there are bugs? So, um, so basically, and then, you know, so, so that goes into like, you know, readability of the code. Um, and then things, this is sort of more of an end user perspective thing. It's also like a Python style thing. Uh, we wouldn't use, you know, we wouldn't use all caps, uh, variables here. And the, the other main thing is consistency. So, um, you know, the, 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 and the code base, you know, strives to be more consistent than it is. The config stuff is why I was so mad about that, is we need to make that more consistent. Um, but um, this is, and also sort of as it relates to consistency, if something is consistently wrong, then we know that we can change it in the same way in the future, right? So if we're going to do something, whatever it is, let's be consistent, right? So it, this rule applies here. So these guys, there's an inconsistency with the capitalization. Um, so let's let's lowercase it. Um, uh, is there a shorter... Let me make sure we're recording. Yeah, okay, so is there a shorter, um, you know, a name that we could use this name that we could use for this? Um, we can put the full description in the uh, help text. Okay. It can be like header equals to true or false because that's how Pandas did it. Yeah, what, it, what was it, header? Header. If you have a header, you said it true. If you don't have, it's false. Great. Uh, yeah, and once and that's a perf that's also a perfect example of like okay, if there are ways that you know that other people already know about doing things, choose those ways, right? Like invent invent new terminology and new uh, stuff as little as possible, and 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 try to stick with things that that people know, right? Um, you know, unless you absolutely have to. Sometimes you're in a space where you're doing things that you 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 know you're you're, it's exploratory work and there's not really good names for things or there's not really, you know, you know, there's not really something standard or something else that you can fall back on. Right. Or maybe you don't know about it. Um, but do your best if you do know about it to try to make sure that it, it stays consistent. Um, default equals true. All right. Great. So uh, the other thing that I do when I'm doing pull requests is so I have found this is more of a me thing. Never mind. Um, let's see. So 
I was what I was going to say is basically I always hit comment and not start review because as you guys know I forget about things and then, <laughs> and then you don't have maybe almost all of your review because I forgot then I was going to make one more comment. So um, okay, this is another thing. So if we change this up here, I try to resist the urge to go through and change the rest of them um, because that is not a good use of time. They'll have to do that anyways. So let's see. So load FD, file object dot name. Okay, so right here we've got an issue. Um, so, and what does the CI say about this? I don't think it's going to get run in the CI, is it? CI is not known first request. Something like that has happened. Oh, yeah. So the other thing is so this. This one won't end up getting run in the CI because you have to add each plugin to the matrix. And so this one never got run in the CI because they didn't add the plugin to the matrix. Um, this is another problem that will be fixed by moving to the second party stuff. Um, so, and also our CI job times are going to go way down. So, or will they go way up? I guess we'll see. Dependency, depends on the dependency tree of the things you're changing. So, File object dot name is not something that you can rely on. Um, this probably worked with a regular file. Let's see, what did we test with? Async test case, test XLS X source. Okay, so temporary directory for testing. Okay, tester random. Okay, so we open the file. Okay, so this probably worked fine because we passed in a real file. And so the file object handle, um, the, the handle diffml source file. So this is the file, you know, the, the base class here for the file based um, stuff. So the call to open, since this is a regular file, we're gonna hit the call to open, which is gonna give us a file object with a name attribute. But if we had ended up with a call to like the zip file helper, we would not have a dot name attribute. So, and this is uh, this is one of those things that is caught. Um, so we know for how would we, so how would we catch that this is possibly an issue, right? Well, we know that we're implementing off of the file source base class, right? So we know that we're going to call load FD. So we know that, you know, we should, okay, so load FD comes in, where does load FD get called? So load FD is here, right? So then this is how we would see that. And we would see, you know, that, you know, as a reviewer, I know that we're not testing the rest of these paths, right? Because um, I see that we're going it, obviously, we're only testing with one file type, right? Um, and the base class is going to call the load FD based on, you know, with, with, with it, can, it could possibly accept other file types. So we have, and this is another thing where, so the coverage information. So that's another thing that we're going to get better with the second party plugins is because we have the coverage distributed across so many CI jobs. Um, you know, we could think, I just figured out a way that we could fix that, but we needed to move to the second party plugin. So we're going to have better coverage information now because we'll actually have it on each one. Did it kick us off? Let me see if I can share again. Yeah, we're gonna. I'm. I'm. I'm I bet you Revolt has video. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, and I got the paper. I was just looking at a, a package manager the other day that, that is interesting for a Linux distro. Um, 
see. Okay. Okay. Let me let me focus. Um. Okay. We'll do that later. So. Okay. So yeah. So basically, you know, the thinking. How would we catch this bug? Right. The first thing I'm looking at is are we looking at an object, right? We're looking at this object where we don't know what the properties are, right? We know, first of all, this is not a file object, right? The, the method name says load FD, so we should be accepting a file descriptor, right? Um, which maybe our tutorial says file object, um, but it's a file descriptor, right? And a file descriptor is, um, well, it should be an integer, but you know, we're, we're assuming it's a basic, like a generic Python file descriptor, right? Which doesn't, necessarily have a name attached to it um, so we talked about coverage essentially you know you would see this we're, we're looking in here because we know that we're, we've got a base class involved and so we're thinking thinking okay well how what is our code path to load fd through the base class and we've identified you know, code cub will tell us this once we have the second party stuff but from a general perspective, if you didn't have that, you would know that you need to trace through the base class um, to identify possible issues with that code path. Um, okay, so we can't rely. We can't rely on file object dot name existing. Um, so we need to, and then I like to try to ideally you try to link to code examples so um so where is that so source um file okay file exists okay so the other methods of opening a file um, will not are not are not guaranteed. However, you spell that uh, will not always um, give a dot name on file object. Okay, so we should, so load workbook. So essentially we're saying, yeah, so we're saying, okay, where is this load work, workbook? So now let's go check this out. Come on. Man, my computer is just being slow today. Okay. All right, so is this the right thing? Yes, it is. Okay, this is not what I want. Uh, where is the real API docs? Where's the you know, where's the source code? Always look at the source code. It's better than like if there's API docs, great. But uh, what's even better is looking at the source code. Um, so yeah, first thing, check the API docs. If the API docs don't answer your question immediately, then you know, um, jump to the source code. So example, where's the API? This is an example, example. There we go. Okay, load workbook. Read only, file name, so file name. String or file-like object open in binary mode. Okay, so we can pass it directly a file object. So we'll link to this documentation where we found that. Okay. Uh, but this is also a reader. So what about the writer? Because I think we're supporting writing here. So, okay, where is this? Load workbook. Load workbook. So what if the workbook doesn't exist? Who knows? Because I could tell you it doesn't exist right here. So allow empty true. So it's going to... So save, so this must load workbook, reader, load workbook, 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 work. I don't think that reader is the correct one. I don't know if that's the one we're going to load workbook. Is that where we're going to end up? Open the file name and return the workbook. 
Eh, you know, this is and this is where I would basically say, okay, so at this point we will see, right? So we found the documentation. The documentation. Let's look at the source while we're at it. The documentation says this is a reader. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sold on this working, but the documentation says it will work. So at this point, I would say we have them make the code change, and if it doesn't follow the documentation, then we make another change. But, you know, this is sort of one of those things where we should probably just change it to file object. Um, why are you pay? Okay. Let me see. Let's get a name on file object. So uh, then we would link to the appropriate documentation where we found that so that they know what we're talking about. Um, so the load workbook, um, method or function, not that it really matters. Um, function, um, says that it can take, and then a quote, string or file like object or path, or so, I like to just put this references. Um, let's see, let's try to pass the file object directly. Let's see if that works. All right. So at this point, you know, you can't know everything is the thing, right? You can't like, you can know some things for sure, but you really don't know anything until the CI runs, right? So provide what advice you can, right? Provide what information you can. And then, you know, sort of, you know, then you can reevaluate once you have new, new information, right? Um, so then let's see. So, so what do you see as a potential problem? Uh, how do you foresee a potential problem in maintaining stuff like how some part of code can be potentially be a problem in future? Mm, okay. And how do you foresee that? Like that is a question. So, for example, whenever you have multiple code paths, um, so these things are examples of possible problems. Um, like so you have you have two code paths through this right and they're very similar and this is where you 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 know you you could you could quite likely end up with an issue so what how might we rewrite this um so that we end up with so because anytime you have multiple code paths you have uh so for example if you had a change in the future where you would need to change this line you might forget to change this line right and so any time where you have, you know, repeated code, try to reduce that. So for example, I would say, and there's also, you know, there's many, there's many schools of thought on this. So there will be people that rail against what I'm about to do. But um, so some people will tell you that you should not use generators and you should not use turn ternary operators. Um, but I say make less code paths. Um, so, because the thing is, there's there's also there's this trade-off between readability, right? And um, and because your code, right, your code's going to be read more times than it's written. So you need to make sure the code is readable. And so if we we have a decision here, we can have an if else block at this outer level, or we can have an if if else block right here, right? So I would say that first of all i would say people the the argument that you shouldn't use generators because they're not readable if you're coming from other languages uh, i i say that's unfortunate however all languages have quirks and if we write everything the exact same way then you know there's no point in having different languages um, this is why they all have their specific features so i would say and let's see we change this to header yes for, for 
people in Python, it is much more readable. Like it, it is. Yeah, exactly. If you operate in Python, you're going to say, uh, you know, this is going to be very native to you. And if it's not, it will be the more you read it, right? And 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 I understand that that is, you know, maybe not the most popular opinion. However, uh, the language is just, you know, the the language is just. The language is not the language that you're writing it doesn't really matter. The thing is everything is just API calls, right? Like you have syntax, right? But syntax is mostly the same across languages, right? And you can have this generator in Python and you may not have a generator in another language, right? But you know that you that you know how to tr you know it's just translating, right? This could just go up here, right? And then this would go in the right under this still. You know, you you have to um focusing on that uh, sort of, you know, misses the point of if you're in a language, use the language, right? Um, okay, so basically sell value if, what is this? Otherwise sell letter, right? So I would say that this is an example of a place where, you know, we detect a future problem. The code works fine, right? This is great. However, now we have less code, right? And less code is always better, or well, not always better, but there is there's a trade there is one two three four, um, there is a trade off to be made with readability, right? Um, I would argue that this is just as readable. Um, you know, if you get if you get to the place where it's not readable, you need to write your own function. It needs to be its own function, right? And then there's also sort of uh, yeah, okay, so let's just say, um, let me just, let me finish this. So basically, let's say, um, let's say, uh, let's condense this into one statement. Uh, okay, so the, and, the, and like I said, the main reason, the main things that I'm looking for are um like the main thing that i look for is if i'm going to change this code later how much how much of a headache is it going to be um so let's see okay so what else do we have here so um stir row record row stir row okay so it looks like we might be taking the entire row and making a string out of it so that's a red flag um because Obviously, let's see. Or well, what is row? No, okay, row is an integer. All right, we're fine there. Um, range and max row. Okay, and you guys also know I obviously really like generators, so that's a bit of a biased inf piece of information. But um, I think that they're nice and they avoid giant for loops with variables where you are redefining things. And yeah. Um, okay, so row self column feature stir row plus one. Uh, I don't like that. Um, so comms feature feature WS. So where's WS? WS is the worksheet. Okay, and anytime you have this type of thing, for example, this this um, yeah, this is another thing uh, that's just sort of uh, this is more of a, a, a a choice, right? So this can be done with the ternary operator, right? You could do that. Um, however, that's that's so. Okay, so you could say it like this and write it all in one line. However, I would argue that this is more readable um, because you have your default case and then you say your exception case, right? So this implies. This 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 does not imply that there's a default, right? This implies that there's a possibility one way, there's a possibility other way, right? But sheet sheet has a default value, right? Sheet or no, it doesn't have a default value. String. Okay. Well, if if a sheet is specified. Okay. So, but that that is sort of a default. So if there is a specification, so in this case. And you don't always end up with this, right? So sometimes dot active is like a property that will do something. In this case, I would say this is the default. If there is a sheet, then select the sheet. Wait, does the sheet have a default? 
No, okay, no, she does have yes. a default, a value of none, right? So this is a good example of default value, otherwise do this, right? Um, yes, that saves as, that saves the... It saves so an that, else. That looks like a elegant flow. It is going in a flow, right? Yeah, okay, so, and then the other thing I like to do is, okay, so this is, there's a few things with Python that sort of, uh, there's a few things that are Python specific that, Okay, so there's a trade-off between verbosity and um, language features. Um, so, so for example, we were just talking about generators, right? This is um, this is this generator doesn't use any funky python language features that you might not have anywhere else right this is a for loop you've got the in operator which yeah you know some people don't some languages don't have that but it people generally know what this means right um now none so none is a python you know things like undefined for example in c you have what do you have you have null in c um you have undefined in JavaScript or null in JavaScript, and then in Python, you have none. Um, and, the, you know, take your pick from the other languages, but usually things have some equivalent of null, right? Um, so none is one of those things where, if, for example, okay, so if I'm coming in, where's that JavaScript thing? Okay, if you're familiar with JavaScript, you know that there's an equals equals and an equals equals equals, right? And you... I'm sure hearing that say that's nonsense. Well, it is a bit of nonsense. Um, one compares the type and one compares the um, one compares the type and one compares the actual value, right? So think about if config dot sheet. So config dot sheet is none, right? So but none is not a string. But this if statement will evaluate to the same thing if not, if sheet is set or if sheet is set to a blank string, right? And so you could argue that one means that they mean the same thing, but they don't mean the same thing. So if config.sheet is none is when sheet has not been set, right? But if config.sheet means, okay, so if config.sheet is not none, so this says if config.sheet is set to a blank string, I should still treat it as if it's a, you know, as if it's been set. If you don't say is not none, then you're going to be treating blank strings as if they're none. And I would argue you should avoid that behavior unless you explicitly want that behavior, right? Um, and we haven't, we don't know whether we explicitly want that behavior or not here. I would say that. Um, it's better to be explicit and treat none as if it's your default or no default. Um, so if it's not none, does that make sense? I know that some people may not agree with that, but I would say that it's better to be more explicit about uh, the fact that your default or not default. Now, I think a better option is to do kind of like what they do with... Yes, because a lot of things can be true. Like, uh, exactly. They can pass through that F stuff and it's not necessary that. Exactly, yeah. And you don't know what kind of call stack is going to come all the way down, right? You may, you may end up like blank string likely is not a valid sheet name, but if it is a valid sheet name, then all of a sudden you have an issue, right? And you're not supporting that valid sheet name, right? Um, so what I do, I love this, what they did here. Um, okay, this, I love this. So this is great. Um, so basically what they've done is they've defined this missing type thing and then they instantiate a instance of this missing type. And, and they also do this for like default and no default. And that way, if you have a value of none, like if none is a valid value, you can compare to say if field is missing and 
you don't have to deal with the fact that, you know, the field might, you know, you're never going to set the field to missing, but you might want to set it to none, right? And if you declare the specific type, then you can actually have something that allows you to have none as a default val or as a set value. Um, okay. So what else? Okay, so we simplified that. We got rid of some lines there. We did sheet as a default. This all looks good. So let's just say, so columns feature, where's columns? Okay, this is columns. If cell value columns if cell value record column names for convenience else column dot letter column dot letter okay so this just creates a mapping of letter to letter for the first row so is this the first row the other question is do we are, are our index starting at zero here because right now it looks like we're not reading row zero. So worksheet, let's go look at the documentation. And this is another thing where, you know, this, I would not go, okay, so the other thing is, I would not usually go this deep, right? We're doing this now because for the exercise of doing this, but this is the type of thing where if I think, I'm wondering what about one, right? I, I would, I'll, okay, so I would say, if I'm wondering what what happens with one, should one be one, I'm just going to say, you know what, it doesn't matter because we're going to make the changes and we're going to run the CI and we're going to see what happens, right? So, because there's a chance that, yeah, they're perfectly right. Maybe the the maybe it starts at one, right? Um, but I would bet that your headers start at zero. Um, but you know, maybe maybe the zero at one, maybe the header one, right? Yeah, the, I'm, that's my guess. My guess is that the zero with row should be the header one, right? Because max WS max column. So this is max column plus one. So is this, and then the other question is max column, you know, is this something that's set based on what is the, is this the maximum column in the worksheet or is this the, um, or is this the last defined column, right? Um, you know, the last column with any data in it. Um, I have this bird that keeps coming and knocking at the back window. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so, but like I said, okay, but it doesn't really matter because we're going to find out when we run the CI. So always remember, and this is the thing, so this, and you guys know this in our code reviews that we've done together. The unfortunate part of this is now we're going to have some lag time between the two of us when we do the review of we have to look at the CI. Now, the thing is, I could spend the next hour trying to figure this out. If, you know, for some of some issues like this, I might have to dig through and run things. And it just, it just doesn't make sense, right? We can ping pong back and we can see the CI. We have to figure out how do we use, you know, both of our times most effectively, right? If, if we wanted to, we could spend all day call tracing through every piece of source code that's involved. But you have to make a decision of what am I going to find out anyways, you know? Um, so yeah. Okay. So this is, like I said, we'll find out, um, we'll look at the logs. We'll see what happens. Um, dump FD initialize self dot com to next empty dictionary. If file does not exist, create a blank workbook. Okay. Try self dot WB. Okay. So basically they're trying to access this parameter. Don't like that at all. Um, they don't like this. Um, these things should be anything that try, try catch block, not a fan. Um, there are methods that, that do this type of thing. So basically if has at herself.coms and also, also, so you also should, okay, so here's another thing. So anything that's set on self really should be set within a knit. Um, and it should be set to something that maybe declares it as, for example, okay, so for example, this is a classic A enter, A exit, or enter and exit thing, but we've just wrapped some of that stuff, and so we're in load FD and dump FD. So I would say that you should set self.com, where's an example of this? Um, source. Uh, I mean, I'm, 
I'm sure that we're not following this advice somewhere too, but since we're trying to figure out everything at the moment, um, let's see. So, JSON, no, any, it needs any, but any do this. And he's not going to do this. Um, where does this? Oh. Uh, no, test case. Until I sent test case. No. So, I think. Okay. No, no, okay. And here's an example where we're not doing it too. <laughs> okay. Um, so what this should be is self.stack equals none or del self.stack. Um, actually, probably del self.stack and del self.a stack, right? So this gets rid of them. This will unallocate them. This allocates them. And then I would say that def init you should really have them initialized to like none. This is, this would be the, uh, you know, I want to say idiomatic, but I'm not sure if that's the right word. This would be like the way that you're supposed to do it, right? You initialize everything in a net. You might use it somewhere else. And honestly, I'm not sure about delling it, but you could do that. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing about as you, you, I often set it to none, and then I'll do a check to say if this thing, yeah, you should not del it. You should set it to none. Um, now, I hate this because then you end up with the same code two places, right? Um, but even, it's just two lines, but it's annoying. Um, so then what you can do is, and this is a common thing with context managers like this, is you might check for re-entrance, which is basically trying to call enter or a enter twice. Um, and some context managers support that, like, and some do not, right? And if you write your code like this, then you can say, you know, if self.stack is not none, there's code somewhere in the code base that does this, uh, you know, raise no intro, no, uh, like, you know, context manager. Simple model does that, I guess. Simple model does ah. that kind of thing that if it already in context, don't go in context. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Yep, there it is. Yeah, thank you. Um, I worked on this file <laughs> a <laughs> yeah. lot. <laughs> So yeah, so this is, and yeah, there's in context. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. So we define it here, check it here, and then, you know, do something with it here to reset it, right? Um, yeah, this is an interesting, uh, let's see. So anyway, so that's the paradigm there. Um, so I would say, you know, here, basically, uh, we should say, and what is this? So this is a, mo this should be a context. No, it's an XLS source. So I believe an XLS source. Okay, so in file source basically does this stuff by faking the context and having the context be itself. You have most source file. Also, should this be a binary file source? It probably should be a binary file source because this is not a text-based file. So, uh, you know, this should probably be binary file source. Uh, so, there's a binary. Uh, binary file source. Okay, so here's the other thing. God damn it. Uh, okay. Um, I hate that. Okay, so... Okay, uh, here's the thing is, uh, basically what I'm trying to say is classes, classes are not great. Um, I don't like them because they hide stuff, right? This is why uh, I'm a big fan of the, the data flows and stuff, right? It, 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 it hides less stuff because you're, you're going from function to function, right? And there's still some stuff that you don't see, 
but anytime you have this inheritance stuff, you you, you end up sort of hiding things, right? And then it's, you're not hiding things. It's just hard to tell that this exists. Like, how do I know that this is here and I want to use it, right? Um, and this is part of the motivation behind all the data flow stuff is, okay, hopefully it becomes easier to figure out that, hey, I have a binary file. I want to use the binary file operation to open it, and then I'll pass it to my load FD, right? That's sort of, you know, meta project-wise why, why design decisions. Um, but if you're working with classes, then you need to make sure that you go look in the classes, right? Um, so then I would say this looks good. So basically this uh, lets um, define uh, self.coms. Let me just link to that actually, since you, you posted that. So let's look at diffml uh, model. I swear there's somewhere that's a little, a little more just like just the set and init. Um, you know, maybe we'll just copy this. Okay. Here we config. Okay. Did I only get the enter? Okay. Okay. So, um, and then this is, you know, load FD. Um, and we're looking at context here, or columns. Okay, so dump 50 and, you know, we may not actually want to reset columns on dump 50 here. Um, if self.columns is none, then self.columns is, eh, I don't like that. Uh, I would say this is a good example of sort of that first one we went over with the if else. So I would say um, columns, wow, equals this. If self.columns is not none, then, you know, columns equals self.columns. Right now, now you've got your local variable to work with. Um, uh, and self .coms, we should probably set self .coms equals and self .coms. Okay, let's define columns. Uh, in init. Oh, and I find that using using the markdown formatting, I think, really helps. Um, so I, I think that it, it helps people understand what you're talking about when you format it correctly. Um, so it's worth trying to do. Um, so, okay, so self.coms, coms, uh, da, da, da. let's define self.coms in init. Um, Uh, and avoid using a try catch file. Uh, avoid. Okay, yeah, just try blocks should really be avoided at all costs. Um, they should really be, you should really treat this as sort of like, if you know exactly how you're going to handle an error, then do it, right? Um, for example, name error, attribute error. Okay, so like that, that's, this is a good example where, uh, okay, this is, well, this is a bad example. Um, load workbook. If you had something specific and then you did something specific, that's good. Or if you're doing something generic, for example, the data flows, 
they don't know what's executing, right? So they have to have try except, well, actually, I think they actually handled the error without the accept block due to the async IO stuff. But generic stuff where you don't know what your error is, yeah, try accept block. You know, if you do know what your error is, try accept block. Otherwise, really try to validate your data beforehand so you don't end up in a try accept block. Um, let's see. Da, da, da. That looks okay. How's this out comms? Okay. Config sheet. Okay, so we have, we need to check. Um, let's see. So this uses sheet without checking if it's none. Uh, we need to ensure sheet is not none before creating. Um, okay, yeah, and here we may have just, once again, so this type of thing, this hopefully, hopefully they will see this comment and then move this logic, you know, up here. Um, so let's see, this checks if Okay, so, ah, I need to ensure that C is not done before creating it. Okay. Active. Yeah, so let's uh, workbook dot sheet names equals zero. And this would be this is a list. Then there's no reason to get the length of it. We can just say if the list is empty. Um Now that is more of a Pythonic type of thing, but there's definitely, you know, so like I said, basically trade off between language features, right? You know, there, there's, there's an aspect of things where you really want to be, you, you know, you, you want to try to be true to the language. And then there's sometimes where you want to try to be more uh, generic, you know, depending on, it really depends on how how unfamiliar is this going to be to other people, right? If it's if it's if it's going to be if you think it's within reach for people coming from other languages, you know, definitely do it. If you think that it's going to be out of reach, for example, operator overload. I hate operator overload because you don't you have to you have to know that you're you're you see two objects and you're like, great, okay, now I have to go. Or for example, when you're refactoring, if you use operator overload, um, you now no longer have the ability to do like a find and replace on the methods that should be, for example, doing the add operator on two objects. Um, try that's like an example of trying to keep for you know to get away from that type of stuff. Um, okay, so set desired sheet is active. I think we're almost done here. Um, uh, great. Okay. So, create blank sheets, no sheet. Okay, so we create the sheet. We should check if sheet is none. So if sheet is none, do we have to create it? This is another thing where it's like, okay, now we don't know the API. Um, so is it a possibility? Let's look up here. So there's no sheet. So basically we assume that we're grabbing the active sheet and that's in the case of a load. So, if there is a workbook, will it have a sheet? Let's check it out. Simple usage. Write a workbook. Okay, so it's got an active one. So it looks like we have an active sheet, even if we if we select active, but we haven't. Yeah, so we select active, but we haven't called create sheet. Then, so we could, oops. So select active, but we haven't called create sheet, we will end up with a sheet anyways. So in that case, okay, but they're saying if no sheet names, create sheet. Okay, I see what they're doing. Set desired sheet is active. So if you have a sheet, if you want a specific sheet name, you should create it before you select okay this but what's going on here because this is saying config.sheet and this says if not sheet name so we should really 
we should really be checking if this should really be a check for if not in sheet sheet names right so basically what we really want to do here is we really want to create the sheet if it does not exist right and then we won't really want to it looks like we want to create All right, so it looks like we're trying to create the sheet if it does not exist. So let's make that what we're doing. And then this should be simplified here because we shouldn't end up without. And this is once again, so I would say, eesh, like what's gonna happen here? I don't know what's gonna happen here is the problem. So I think this is a case where we don't wanna do that default behavior. Um, you know, the default behavior thing that we just did here right because i don't we don't know what happens create sheet is it a sheet we don't know what happens when you do dot active and you haven't created any sheets like we don't know what name you end up with on this sheet um so i would say that to be safe we shouldn't do the default thing we should make sure we should preserve the if else block, right? Um, so, and then we should say, so if, and this is, I would say, I would write is not none. So I would write your, okay, well maybe, yeah, I would write your non default first because this is, okay, if I'm supposed to do something with this variable, then do it, otherwise, drop through, right? So sort of like you've got a switch statement in something like C, you know, you're sort of, what happened here? Your highlighting is off. Why is your you highlighting know, off? Python 3.10 has introduced a switch statement. Oh, they did? Oh yeah, I think I read that. Yeah, oh my gosh, I'm excited. It's about damn time. Um, okay, so, oh, that's great, great news. So I think this is probably satisfies our thing. Um, and once again, you know, what happens if we do dot active? We don't know. So let's make sure that we do, you know, let's, let's make sure. Because my guess is if you do dot active, it's going to give you a default name, right? So if the first thing you access is dot active, you're going to end up with a sheet with a default. Uh, otherwise, you should really just do the sheet. Okay. So then here, basically, okay, I look at this wall of text here and I say, great. I could go through and I could trace through every line of this. But what is this supposed to do? This is supposed to write out an Excel file. So I'm going to say run the CI. And if the test case looks sane, I'm going to know that that block of code does what it's supposed to. Right? So I'm going to go look at the test case. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say that this looks none. None is expected behavior because columns are empty. I don't like that. Um, that should be configurable. So, okay, but this is a bigger problem. So this is one of those, this is a sort of bigger fish to fry type of thing. So this is one of those, okay. So I would say that, oh God, this is annoying. Um, so, Okay, how do we deal with this? So this is one of the, whenever you're reading and writing things, you get into this crap. Um, so we, we, if we read out, none is expected behavior because columns are empty. And this is, we've already written the file. So, save and load. So what happens, so if I save, so if I put it in there, okay. And now, so now what I'm thinking about now is we have an interaction with the memory source. I think we're about to run out of time, but I think we're almost done here and we'll just call it if we do run out. So we have an interaction with the memory source here, which might give us inconsistent behavior. So the memory source basically caches the stuff in memory 
until you know you do the until until you exit the double context entry right so if i did this assert dict equal here um if we had the source open for example within a double context entry and we read the features of a we wouldn't have c and d uh, you guys see what i'm saying because C and D are populated only because they existed when we added record two and we read both both records back after having the save file. Yes, yes, that makes sense. Yeah, so this is a possible once again possibilities for inconsistencies, right? So you know inconsistencies in code or inconsistencies in behavior, right? And so there's ways there's multiple ways to deal with this, um, and I would say one way is to this is this is one way make it consistent that can sometimes be incredibly difficult or not possible or something that you don't want to do right it, obviously like we're not we don't know that c and d exist if we checked it after we inserted record we're not going to know that c and d exist until we reload the stuff uh, if we were within an entry so it's not gonna there's not a way to make that consistent so none the other way you know the other way you can deal with it is to document it um if you have inconsistent behavior it's it, it's it's okay to have inconsistent behavior so long as people know what's going to happen you know in different cases so in this case in this case like i would think about the use case here and the use case is probably read a bunch of records in from an Excel file and do some machine learning and dump out one column. That's probably going to be your prediction column. Um, and what happens if we have null values? So I think none is a good thing to have there. I think that it could, should be configurable. So you might want to read zero or something instead. Uh, the other thing is that does it really matter, right? We should probably be feeding, you know, you may want to actually just feed the stuff through a pre-processing source anyways. So from that perspective, none, you know, who cares if it's none? We can replace none with zero uh, when we're pre-processing with the data flow. So I think this is probably fine for now. Um, I think that we should have something that says that it will replace. I think we need to document that. Um, so I would say, you know, the class doc string. Okay, so, you know, uh, so cells with the cells with empty values will be um, treated or have featured data for that cell. set to none okay now we've documented it so we're good to go um now will somebody be mad when inevitably they're like why is my thing none yes always we're always mad when uh things don't work on the first try but uh we will at least have an explanation for them so um and then what else is there to do here? So the last thing is, you know, I'm not seeing features or predictions. And this is a constant thing that we have with all our sources, which is really annoying. Is like, how do you deal with predictions? Um, so I think we dealt with it recently. So we need to figure out this is, and this is mainly a, a so a reading and writing thing. Where did we deal with this? Do you guys remember? Um, I don't know if it was one of you that had to deal with this recently, but let's find out and this is the other thing this is my new favorite thing um i think i've been preaching about this to you guys but this git log dash p i mean this thing is just the best uh because you can just look at every commit and you can look at specific files and you can say you know what happened in this file or what 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 happened in this directory right um and um it, it provides you with essentially a set of examples in a lot of ways. So what do we have? We're looking at predictions. Okay, so data frame source. Ah, this must be where it was recently. So who did this? Uh, oh yeah, 
Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. The data frame source. That's right. Um, so this is an example where we had to do the same thing where it's like, okay, you know, the data frame looks very much like a CSV file or an Excel file. So how do you decide which columns are predictions? Um, and this is also related to Hashim, your confidence and prediction splitting PR. Um, did we just get dropped again? No, okay, 10 minutes. All right, we're going to wrap up here. <laughs> so, but this is related to your confidence and prediction splitting PR is like, okay, well, you know, I would, <laughs> we have these predictions. It makes it, it will make it easier when we have that PR merge. It'll make it easier to say, uh, predictions and then confidences or something, right? And so then we could potentially, because right now it's it's kind of ambiguous how a source should deal with reading and writing predictions and their confidences because there's two values associated with the prediction, right? Um, and so what we did in the data frame source was just list, you know, these are columns which you should treat as predictions. Um, and that that I mean I don't know if this is the best way to do it, but it is one way to do it, and it and and you have to know your predictions ahead of time. Um, but you know this is one of those things about the separation between models and sources and uh, accuracy scores and all that is trying to think about what data should you know, right? If there's a possibility that you don't know a piece of data with, for some plugin. Maybe it should go in another plugin, or maybe it should have its own plugin, right? Because we need the plugins, you know, the plugins are specific to the data that they're working with, right? It's an implementation that's specific to the data it's working with. And so I would argue that the source would know what, you know, the source would know likely what the what the predictions that should be, like what, what we should treat as predictions out of the source, right? Um, and so this this is um this is how we do that right at least this is how i did it with the data frame source um so i would say we should follow that same pro uh, pattern here so i would say, so i'm going to link to the data frame source and i'm going to say uh source data frame or is it df Okay, yeah, so I would say uh, predictions. Okay, yeah, so let's just say, let's just say reference the data frame source. Um, and I think that will be good. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, okay, so where is that? So, and I would say the way that I would phrase this is, if you know that something's going to be needed in the implementation, uh, so for example, I'm what I'm going to say back is, let's make sure that we've tested this. Let's make sure that we've testing this with predictions in records. It would be a shame if we made a bunch of predictions with the model and then couldn't save any of them to the Excel file. So this is, and then you also need to make a decision on what is a gating factor to the PR and what is not. For example, predictions, definitely a gating factor. You know, the source is not really usable. Uh, I mean, it is usable, but I would argue this is, you need to make an assessment, a judgment call on what is it okay to merge and then create as an issue and track the issue and what is it okay what must be done before we get the thing merged? Because you're going to get a, you, there's a huge drop off that happens, right? And, and we all know this, right? You're working on your PR, you're working on your PR, you get it merged, and then you're like, okay, now I have a million other things that I have to do, right? And chances are you're not going to get back to those issues that you were supposed, to, that you need to fix as follow up issues for a while. So you need to make sure that if you're going to merge a PR, you're okay with it not getting fixed for a while if you stand, if you create issues and say, fix those later. Um, uh, you can use the data frame. The data frame source is a good reference. So, any questions, comments, concerns on the code review that we just did? It, it was really nice. Like, I would also go, go through this once more just to like collect the points. A lot of points were there. Okay. I'm and I'm happy to do this again. Obviously, this took a little over an hour. Um, 
code review takes a long time, right? Um, and uh, especially when yeah. you have to be verbose about your thought process. Right? Yeah, it yeah, I was, yeah, I was trying to give you guys my whole thought process here. And but you, you know, this pretty much is how long it takes me in general, because um, you know, there was a lot of clicking around and stuff, and you have to dig through source files, and it it it, it takes a long time if you're gonna go through it and really you know try to provide a lot of feedback um, and the other thing is this is why we're so religious about all these ci jobs right it's because for example okay we need to go do the i sort thing um, because this is a good example of where i sort would be fixing this type of thing right or telling us that that's a problem um, because we want to just make sure that the code review that we're doing is really it it should be less about the functionality the people implementing stuff know they're implementing it because they know the functionality right what we're trying to do is is help them make that functionality you know accessible to other people you know and accessible via the interfaces they're exposing it and then maintainable long term since it's a contribution right and and let them let them be the expert in the way that they write out the Excel file, right? Um, just make sure that it conforms, right? Consistency with everything else. Okay, so the data frame source is a good example of how we handle predictions for something with columns. Okay. Um, and I think that might be sufficient. Let's see. To make sure we're testing with predictions and records. Okay, and then let me probably link to the data. Well, they can find the test for that. Okay. All right, great. So I think well, this is uh, this is a long meeting today. Thanks for sticking around, guys. Um, and it was you know it's great talking to you guys. And uh, we will get. So I'm I'm going to I'm going to do the second party thing by next week um, because or else I'm going to be in stressed out that it's not done um and i'll look at this package manager uh paper here let me oh that doesn't really link me to it uh, that will copy link address and then um and then i i'm probably so i'm probably which what i'm saying is i might be slow i'll try to go through and do my five issues like i was talking we we talked about last week need more info uh but but maybe i'll i'll, I'll definitely do one um, it's it's perfectly fine. Do it Would you like us well, both any of us to pick something up that might help you in your old process, something like that? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll keep it in mind and I'll I'll yeah, I'll ping you. you can like ping us on yeah. Twitter or I'll ping you guys. Um, okay. So we did PR review uh, and then infra. Man, we we'll talked about that some other time uh, because yeah, I saw what you said and. and it sounds like we're basically in agreement on, on or well, we both have the same understanding about pulling out the tokens. So, okay, we'll figure that out though. That's sort of a long-term thing, not super critical. Um, I'm, you know, we'll run it off the droplet that I already have for a while, and then we'll configure it out. Sure, so. sure. You will start using Brave, and then you'll never be able to go back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I'm hoping so. It looks good, and then we could do the meetings in there and stuff, hopefully, and we can set up everything. And yeah, well, sweet. All right, good talking to you guys today, and, and I hope you have a good you know rest of your evening, and uh, I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. You too.